Hi everyone, this is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest, but I've been following his work for a while and I really respect it. It's Daniel McAdams, and he's the executive director of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. He served as foreign affairs advisor to U.S. Congressman Ron Paul from 2001 until Dr. Paul's retirement at the end of 2012. Thank you for joining us, Daniel. Hi, Jason. Great to be with you. Now, um, Daniel, we were discussing this beforehand. Um, the, the U.S. has essentially declared economic warfare on Russia and Putin. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to escalate, I guess, this conflict in, in the Ukraine. We've just seen these sanctions put on by the U.S. against Russia and Putin. You know, we've seen downgrades in Russian debt by U.S.-controlled uh, government bond agencies or currency attack. Uh, what do you think is the end game goal here for, um, for, for this uh, foreign policy plan with Russia and Putin? Well, I think the U.S. has been determined ever since the so-called Wolfowitz plan to deter the rise of any potential rival power in the world. And I think that that Wolfowitz plan, and I'm sure he wasn't the first person to think of it, but that has been the operative plan since certainly at least the end of the Cold War. You know, many of us thought that with the Cold War ending, we would see a different kind of foreign policy uh, that the U.S. would be able to uh, you know, to, to pull back on its defense spending, to pull back on its attempts to change regimes overseas. You know, I think it was debatably, um, it was debatably appropriate if you, uh, for the U.S. to attempt to overthrow uh, communist regimes. I, I personally, in retrospect, think it, w- it was a bad idea, but you could at least make the argument that this was a threat. So then you could expect after the end of the Cold War that this sort of thing with the communist threat gone would come to an end. However, what we saw was an increase in U.S. intervention overseas. The U.S. wasn't simply happy that the communists had ceased to rule in places like Eastern Europe. They wanted to determine who would rule in their place afterward. And so that that meant a lot more jobs, of course, but it meant a lot more intervention. As to what the U.S.'s end game is in Russia, I think ultimately it is regime change. It is to get rid of the Putin regime. Of course, the, the people who run U.S. foreign policy, as we know, Jason, they've been wrong in essentially everything they've done. They completely misread Russia, and one does not need to be a, a Russia expert to understand this. Uh, they believe that Putin is as far right or nationalist, or whatever you want to call it, as it gets. However, uh, they misunderstand the opposition in Russia. So if they are successful, and I don't think they will stop until something happens, uh, but their success will be yet another failure. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, P- Putin has an, what, an 85, cor- correct me if I'm wrong, an 85% approval rating, uh, according to polls in Russia, despite, you know, the massive inflation in the Russian economy, the Russian ruble being attacked, the oil price dropping. So the, the Russian people seem pretty resilient, pretty tied to their leader. But yet, you know, we see all these news stories come out in the American media that, you know, the uh, Putin's main political rival was assassinated, which seems, you know, humongous red flags to me that why would Putin bother risking doing this when his approval rating is already so high? He, it doesn't seem to make any sense to me why he would need to want to do this. Well, it's another example of how the, the Western media distorts the reality in Russia. You know, Boris Nemtsov was had been an important political figure in the Yeltsin regime. He had attained the position of a deputy prime minister, but his days were long since past. As a matter of fact, he didn't even have a seat in parliament. And in 2003, I think, was the last time he seriously contested an election in Russia, and his party was unable to to um, w- uh, to make the 5% threshold for, for uh, seats in parliament. So his party wasn't even in parliament. How can you call someone like that a, a, a leader of the opposition. It's, it doesn't make any sense. What the U.S. doesn't want to admit, the U.S. media doesn't want to admit, admit or perhaps doesn't know, is that the real political opposition in Russia is called the Russian Communist Party. It's the only other party that has a significant following. There are many people who are attracted to it, and it is much more anti-American than, than, than Putin's people are. So essentially what the neocons and the interventionists here do is is just pretend that reality doesn't exist and that someone with no seats in parliament is the leader of an opposition. But to your question, you're right. I mean, it's certainly possible that Putin did it. Uh, You know, leaders all over the world do bad things. That's called government. But you're right. How would he possibly benefit knocking off such an insignificant figure? 
Yeah, I mean, his approval rating's already 85. Maybe, you know, if it was a lot lower and he felt threatened, right, that he could lose his uh, spot at the top of the government, it would make more rational sense to me. But maybe he's just, you know, full Machiavellian that um, he, he, he thought no one would notice. I, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's clearly done things. He's not the nicest guy. But um, with the U.S.'s foreign policy and the bullying and the intervention that the U.S. has done in so many different countries, he kind of seems like kind of the nice guy compared to some of the U.S.'s foreign policy and the, the other stuff and the drone strikes, you know, add it all up, that um, they're kind of making Putin look like, you know, the, the one who's being oppressed here compared to maybe um, how he would have been viewed uh, if the U.S. had not been as interventionist with its uh, foreign policy. Well, the foolishness of U.S. sanctions and U.S. Uh, pressure on countries overseas is that it tends to bolster the popularity of leaders. You know, we saw this for more than four decades in Cuba. As a matter of fact, I was, I was down there back when I was in Congress in 2003, and it's extremely convenient for leaders because they can simply blame any shortcoming in their economy or society on, on a foreign on, on, on foreign policy so so the u.s if the u.s is looking to undermine putin ironically they're probably bolstering his popularity because as, as probably any of us would do even if for example we didn't like clinton or we didn't like bush if 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 some big bad country overseas was being extremely nasty to all of us in his name we'd probably start rallying behind him more if anything yeah, yeah, that's very interesting, and it's just like that in economics, too. So I guess foreign policy and economics have, you know, the law of unintended consequences, that these central planners, you know, whether it's the Department of Defense, the State Department, the Pentagon, um, you know, these, these high-level think tank guys who have PhDs in Russian literature, and, you know, they were young adults when uh, the Soviet Union was still in effect, and, you know, they've always not trusted the Russians, even when the Soviet Union collapsed, that um, I guess, you know, they need to earn their paychecks, and they need to come up with um, – with new enemies and new guys to, to go after, because I guess the military industrial complex, even when there's there's peace, right? The indust the military industrial complex, peace is not a good thing for the military mil uh, military industrial complex. It seems. Sure, absolutely. And remember, all of these think tanks with with admittedly very intelligent people, but as you say, r intellectually rigid people who are incapable of seeing a world that changes. You know, the people who come who came up and went through the ranks when there still was a Soviet Union or have a difficult time retooling their, their way of thinking. But there is an incredible groupthink in the Washington, D.C. area among think tanks. Uh, nobody wants to be viewed as, as a radical. You'll, you won't get any more invitations to lavish parties and embassy functions if you're viewed as a radical. And so the people like – oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, I completely agree. I live right outside of Washington, D.C., as you know, and I have some – political contacts too and you know they they think the same way in the economy they're in a bubble <laughs> exactly it's all it's all unreal and if you do take a different position then you're considered i mean i can't tell you jason how many times they've, they've said uh, of course the neocons love to do this oh the ron paul institute is putin's think tank oh this is the kremlin's voice box absolutely absurd we're saying the same things that dr paul said when they were all telling us what a wonderful victory we would have in iraq if we just invaded you know, these are the people who've, who, who've always been wrong, and they're once again pushing another war, and once again the people that resisted are accused of being unpatriotic for resisting a war based on lies. It's, you know, it really is disgusting. It, exactly, and according to the WikiLeaks documents, Daniel, I, I think, um, you know, the U.S. has been planning this uh, destabilization in Ukraine, you know, with Soros and all these other people. Uh, Bradley Manning gave it to uh, Julian Assange, and he released on WikiLeaks. I think the U.S. has been planning this in stages, I think, since 2009, and I think uh, Germany, I think, knew, uh, found out about this, I think, in 2011, and that's why uh, Germany started asking for their goal back, and Germany's, you know, been looking to do these trade deals. Um uh, to with uh, China and Russia and all these other countries because they don't trust the U.S. as much. And, I, uh, you know, we, we look at Edward Snowden and the stuff he released in the information, and the U.S. is supposedly spying on all of its allies. So it's not, it's not adding up to a lot of peaceful behavior from foreign policy and things like that. Well, we do know for a fact that the U.S. was a major sponsor of the Orange Revolution back in 2004, which was a very similar situation – uh, as we had last year, an elected government was overthrown by people in the streets who were very, very lavishly supported by the U.S. government through the National Endowment of Democracy, the International Republican Institute, the National Democratic Institute. These are the U.S. government-funded uh, regime change agencies, and it's, it's very well known that the U.S. was responsible for it. Uh, when things went very badly and the people who 
had a chance to vote again in Ukraine after this regime change, they voted in the fellow who had won in the first place, and that's Yanukovych. So it just goes to show that they had it in for Yanukovych, uh, whatever his faults, I'm not really interested in discussing because that's not our, our area of, of concentration. But the fact of the matter is the U.S. overthrew him the first time he came back in when he was elected, and then the U.S. spent the money to overthrow him a second time this past year. So the U.S. has been clearly involved, and even Victoria Nuland, the Assistant Secretary of State, has admitted how much the U.S. has been involved in Ukraine. So it really is, if it's a secret, it's the most open secret. What I find amazing, Jason, is people who are shocked when we say that the U.S. was involved in the overthrow. It's just, I mean, where, where are these people? Are they sitting just in front of the nightly news and not reading anything beyond the mainstream? It's hard to imagine that in this day and age. That's it. That's exactly what they're doing, Daniel. I mean, there's so much reality TV and so many people in the United States are, are so busy, you know, just trying to pay out all their bills and putting food on the table or they have family obligations or, you know, they're trying to find a girlfriend or a boyfriend or things <laughs> like that. Yeah. So there's there's just so many other things going on in people's life. If they do spend some time on the news, you know, it's maybe 10 minutes watching the, the, the mainstream nightly news with Brian Williams, yeah. who's a you know, pathological liar <laughs> or or, um, you know, Bill O'Reilly or CNN. <laughs> Yeah, or MSNBC or CNN or, or, or all the regular mainstream BS. And people, um, you know, when I brought up how, like, the U.S. Uh, basically put in power Saddam Hussein and, you know, they regime changed with uh, – created a coup with Mossadegh. And, um, you know, I thought Mossadegh was assassinated, but I guess he was just uh, home in prison. But, you know, they're, we're doing all these coups and we're putting in all these puppets. And, you know, I brought up the stuff in Ukraine. People just they, – they don't believe it. And I, I guess because they don't have any time to research it or, or they don't care. Maybe they're afraid of understanding that their government does terrible things in their name. It was not until 2013 that the CIA finally openly admitted its role in the 1953 overthrow of the Mossadegh government. Uh, so the U.S. CIA admitted now, uh, admitted that it was involved. So people think that somehow these activities stopped, you know, from the 50s, that, that they just simply stopped doing it. They don't do it any longer. They're not involved anymore. It's, it seems as they're, they're living in a, in a fantasy land. You know, I, I, exactly, exactly. And then, you know, trying to tell people that, you know, we trained bin Laden, right, to, to fight against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, and we gave him money and training and guns. And, you know, he turned on us. And then you, we can say the same thing, I think, with these ISIS guys, right? And so many, and um, whichever guys are in Iraq, I forgot which group it is. You know, there's just so many of these different groups that, like, the U.S. spun on. And then uh, I think there was on the internet, there was pictures of John McCain, right, posing for pictures, I think, in <laughs> Syria. Yeah posing for pictures in Syria with, um, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood or one of these um, Al-Qaeda spinoffs. And um, the, the, the justifications, these politicians on both sides of the aisle, that they give, oh, well, um, you know, this is not Al-Qaeda in Iraq or something, and these guys are, are on our side. Or so. it, it's just mind-boggling why people would, would go for this. Yeah, we, we put up a thing on the site yesterday that I, I wrote, and it's a great picture that, that came out with, uh, with McCain standing next to a fellow at the time – was his his good friend in Libya who was going to overthrow Gaddafi, and now it turns out that he's now the head of ISIS in Libya. So pointing these things out is not anti-American. A lot of people say, well, you're just unpatriotic talking all the time about the horrible things that the Americans do. But this is not America. This is the American government. This is what the elites are doing in our name. So pointing out the, 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 uh, the, the failures of their interventionism, I think, is is absolutely patriotic because their failures are weakening the United States. They're weakening the economy. They're weakening families uh, who suffer under the burden of high taxes and regulations. Uh, so, you know, we're the real patriots who point out that this is this is counterproductive and it's destroying our country. It, exactly. It's destroying the country from the inside out. And not only that, it's hurting our economy and our brand as Americans globally, right? Because if we're spying on the Brazilians and we're spying on the Germans – um, they're not going to be as likely then to want to trade w with our companies or, um, or you know, all these foreign policy stuff and uh, FACTA and um, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act and so many of these other rules and regulations, whether it's spying or other stuff. It, it's going to – it's uh, and, and then drone strikes in other, in other countries, these things are all adding up one after the other into reasons for why these countries – shouldn't do business with American companies. So it's in, in uh, maybe in the short run, it's not going to hurt us that much. But in the long run, if we keep doing these things and getting worse, it's going to really hurt our, our own economic uh, productivity too. And it certainly hurts Americans who want to trade with Russia, who want to trade with Iran, 
We want to trade with Cuba and Venezuela. It hurts those individuals. So on a very personal level, it's very hurtful. If you had a business and you had a business partner in Russia and you were having a successful business where you had maybe 50 Americans working for you, and all of a sudden for trumped up political reasons, you weren't able to conduct your business anymore. It's absolutely hurtful for, for a large number of people. It's devastating. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And these changes are happening, Daniel, like almost overnight. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah, they're 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 happening. They're happening almost overnight. So it's not like um, the per, the business person is getting any warning warning about these. You know, this is just a, a sucker punch from <laughs> a sucker punch from right out of the blue. There, you don't even know you're in a fight, and you just got sucker punched and knocked out. <laughs> Absolutely. How can you do any serious business planning if you don't know whether next week? The telecom sector in Russia will be subject to sanctions. You know, how can you plan? How can you plan your investments when you don't know what will happen if you'll have your assets seized or something? So it, it makes no sense. The U.S. had been on an increasing trade uh, 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 framework with with Russia. There had been steadily increasing trade until the U.S. decided to, you know, to get very aggressive with Russia. And now it's hurting everyone's economy. And I think. As you pointed out earlier, I believe, I think the Europeans are now starting to stand up and get very nervous. They're, 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 if you look at the – what is it? The euro is down 25 percent this year or something. It's, it's an incredible, uh, it's an incredible uh, uh, you know, blow to their economy, and I think that's why we're seeing some movement on the part of the Europeans to, to get away from this, the sanctions regime, and the U.S. is um, increasingly aggressive stand toward Russia. I was just reading today, Jason, that the U.S. has delivered – something like 100 tanks and 3,000 troops uh, right up to the Russian border in Latvia, and they're going to conduct more exercises. Uh, and and uh, there was a U.S. general who said, well, you know, Russia is the target of these exercises. That's who we're, we're practicing to fight against. And this is somehow not supposed to be provocative, you know. It doesn't – it, I mean it doesn't pass the laugh test. What, was that even mentioned on the mainstream media? Because I haven't heard that anywhere um, in the mainstream. Um, I'm not sure where, which source you heard that well, from. Well, it's uh, it is out everywhere actually, and I'm sure you probably read Zero Hedge. I saw it first on Zero Hedge, but I've seen it since then on on quite a quite a number of media outlets. It's actually even video of the tanks being offloaded in Latvia. But um, Secretary of State Newland confirmed this morning to the U.S. Senate that the U.S. has delivered these weapons, 120 armored units, including tanks. Have landed in Latvia, but nobody is supposed to assume that these are um, these are aggressive or that these are provocative, you know, or these these shouldn't make Russia nervous at all. Can you imagine if if Russia had landed uh, this many things on the border with Texas? You know, the U.S. would be would would be justifiably concerned. Or or even if Russia put it, you know, into Estonia, went marching into Estonia. So I mean, um, yes. Because I think there's been speculation that uh, Putin, after you know, getting back the Crimea uh, in Ukraine, that Putin could go into Estonia. And I, I have a friend who lives in Estonia, so he's brought that up as a major concern. Yeah, the, dom but the yeah, domino theory that's been thoroughly discredited through history. They just keep bringing these things back up over and over again. Of course, what, yeah. of course, what they won't, what they won't say, and this certainly doesn't justify a military invasion. But what they won't say is that there are. Thousands, tens of thousands, I don't know the exact number of ethnic Russians who happen to be living in Estonia who are not allowed to vote because they happen to be ethnic Russians. So there is a huge disenfranchisement of, of ethnic minorities in Latvia and Estonia especially, somewhat less so in Lithuania. This does not justify Russian involvement, but normally if the shoe were on the other foot, the U.S. would be complaining about the treatment of minorities. But in this case, it doesn't count. That's very interesting. I actually didn't know that. But yeah, I, I do know to bring up your point about about Europe, they are very worried about the US, you know, putting all these sanctions on Russia because Europe is so reliant on Russian natural gas. I think Germany needs uh forty percent of their Russian uh their natural gas is imported from Russia. Most of Western Europe relies on Russian natural gas. And here Russia is now because of these US sanctions and uh, because of NATO, all these uh, Western European countries being forced to kind of go along with the U.S.'s policy, uh, Russia is now going to start to move this natural gas through pipelines, I think, through Turkey and also to China. Yes. So, um, you know, these, they're going to have to find other sources of natural gas. And, you know, there could be shortage, uh, probably not in the near term, but there could be shortages. And, you know, in Europe has very cold winters. Well, so that's uh, very dangerous going forward. Talk about the monumental foolishness of the, ba the Baltic countries. Uh, all three Baltic countries rely 100 percent on Russia for its natural gas. 
and yet they're the most bellicose and the most fiercely anti-Russian. It almost seems like a pathological situation for them. Uh, they can't forget history, and okay, I, we certainly can see things from their perspective. They did not appreciate um, being uh, being uh, subjected to, to to life in the Soviet Union, but that is 25 years ago. And they don't seem to be able to put this behind them. So they're really in the in the saying, you know, cutting off the nose to spite their face by irritating the source of 100 percent of their of their natural gas. Do they really think that the U.S. is going to make up the difference? Exactly. And it doesn't make long term sense for them. And the, the U.S. can't export its natural gas anyway. The U.S. doesn't have the liquid natural gas facilities to get it going. I'm, I'm in investments, as you know, the U.S. is at least a couple of years away from getting a, uh, one or two of these uh, liquidified natural gas facilities up and going. So it could take, you know, many years, a decade or more to get most of these uh, liquefied natural gas facilities up to give Europe some additional supply to come in from a, a source other than Russia. So, um, you know, that that's a long time to go, Daniel, without, uh, without yeah. uh, heat. And even then, the expense will be much higher, right, because of the transportation costs and all sorts of things? Oh, these are these are very expensive facilities to build. Um, the, 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 the engineering behind building these liquefied natural gas facilities, it's in the many billions. So, and the costs keep going up and up. They don't they don't really drop. Sure. Yeah. So I'm um, tr transitioning here to the question, broad question here. Do you, do you think most of the U.S.'s foreign policy goals, um, you know, the U.S. talks a big game about democracy this and democracy that. We hear Hillary Clinton and other Secretary of State say this. That's why they do regime changes. But do you think the, the, the main reason behind all of this is the uh, petrodollar? I think that that has a lot to do with it. I, I, I'm always wary of, of putting one reason, you know, one sort of magic reason to, to the U.S. foreign policy uh, moves the way it does. You know, I, Pepe Escobar, who's who's quite a, a a crafty and clever writer, I think he calls it the empire of chaos. You know, this U.S. empire that sort of promotes itself, advances itself by promoting chaos everywhere else. I think that's a reasonable explanation for for U.S. behavior. Uh, I don't think that's the only explanation either. But I think if you put all of these things together, there's a confluence of 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 of, of events and of motivations and of interests and of special interests. I think that can push foreign policy. You know, I was I, I, I worked for Dr. Paul in foreign policy for quite a number of years on Capitol Hill. And I know that it really doesn't take that many very, very motivated people to push U.S. policy in one way or the other. Most of the members simply don't have a clue what's going on in these places. Uh, they may read the Washington Post. They probably rely on their staff. They don't have a clue. You only need to have one or two people who are very highly motivated, and they can have vast, massive influence in policy. That's that. That's really interesting. I mean, because you hear these guys go and they talk their talking points, but they might have been just handed that, you know, five minutes ago and read some bullet. Well, points. here's an example. Look at Senator Cotton. There's a big controversy over a letter that they all sent to the Iranians saying that we're not going to uphold this deal anyway if if Obama makes it with Iran. I don't want to get into any of that. But here's a great example, and I was hoping to write about this today if I can. But here's what Cotton said. They said, well, what do you want? And he said, well, I want, we demand that Iran shut down its nuclear weapons facilities. You know, what are you talking about? This, nobody, nobody believes that they have nuclear weapons facilities. The CIA, the Mossad, uh, the Europeans, the administration, nobody believes that the Iranians are working on building a nuclear weapon. So here's a senator, here's the, the leader of this movement to scuttle these talks, and on the most basic, basic of issue, he is simply, he's simply incorrect. He simply doesn't know what he's talking about. That's pretty frightening, I think. That's, that's very interesting. And yeah, didn't the U.S. Um, com almost completely set back the uh, Iranian nuclear war program? It was, it was progressing up until a couple of years ago when the U.S. Uh, or the Israelis planted the Stuxnet computer virus, right, which completely destroyed um, you know, any hopes of um, – it was specifically targeted at the centrifuges and stuff. So I, I think like the Iranians are – I can't believe he, he, would, he would know that. I guess maybe he spent – five minutes or less doing any kind of research. He probably could have found good research with 10 minutes on the internet, but you know, that's the type of, um, of politicians we have. We have a lot of mainstream Wall Street people who have that and a lot of Keynesian academics you know, who have their mind made up, their minds are closed about certain issues, they're blind ideologues, and um, you know, even if there's a setback in a policy goal of theirs or a formula or something, they, they just blame it on something else. 
Yeah, it, it really is, and I think people really are, are operating under the false uh, impression that our political leaders are so well informed. I remember hearing it so many times. Well, they have access to so much more information than we do. That's just totally untrue. First of all, most of them are completely uninterested in. They have they have no intellectual interest or curiosity in the world. You know, they're interested in power. They're interested in prestige and how they look so it's raising money right raising if money. It's, you, you, you're in congress right i mean even ron paul to raise some money but he wasn't you know nearly as bad as any of these other congressmen i think they spend almost all their time raising money right well as i was reading uh today that uh that uh you know cotton at the very end of his campaign he's a freshman senator he got a big uh surge of a million dollars from bill crystal's organization which is very strongly opposed to iran and very strongly in favor of Netanyahu. So you do have to pay the piper if you get million dollar checks, you know. That's yeah, it, it, exactly. Those those checks don't come with no strings attached. That's just the way the game works here. Whether it's lobbying money or or super PAC or PAC money, I mean the the money if it's that large, it's coming with a lot of strings attached. And um, most most Americans, I I think they're slowly starting to realize this. You know, these guys are puppets. When Obama was talking about hope and change when he got elected, we we didn't get really any change. I mean, he brought in. Tons of people right from the Clinton administration and from the and from the Bush administration. Look at Victoria Newland. She was an aide to Dick Cheney. You know, it doesn't get any more neocon than that. So, of course, these people, they stay on no matter how wrong they are. You know, if you as a financial advisor, Jason, if you advise someone in, in such a horrible way that they lost all their money and it happened you know, 50 times, your reputation would be shot, wouldn't it? You, know, yes. you wouldn't have a business anymore. But these people. They find success in their failures. It's just incredible. Yeah, it, they're really good at spinning, and they they def, they don't bring up their long term track record. They just change the subject, or they go on to character assassination for who's ever trying to bring up you know question their long term track record of uh, failures. Absolutely. Yeah, I've had to deal as you know since I live right outside of D.C. I try to question some of these people about this, and um you know lower levels either in in congressional staffers or think tank people that I run into or some um or some lobbyists once in a while, and, you know, I just run into this all the time, which is why, you know, I don't even bring up anymore uh, that I'm libertarian. I, I just try and hide it because um, <laughs> I don't want to – yeah, because it's uh, – especially when I'm out dating there with a lot of the women there, I don't want to – I don't want to talk – yeah, I, I don't want to talk about me being libertarian or an entrepreneur <laughs> or things like that. It just – it won't end well. <laughs> okay, well, um, I, I definitely made you laugh there, Dan. Uh, cha changing topics here, uh, before I let you go, I, I want to talk about the – um. The, the Clinton scandals, you know, we just have so many of them now, and she seems like she's made out of Teflon, her and Bill, and, um, you know, she's probably going to end up getting through all of this with minimal excuses, despite the fact that we saw her on Zero Hedge, I think, that, um, you know, her all of her emails are easily, a hacker, I think, easily released all of her emails, right? So um, she's probably going to end up uh, president or get the Democratic nomination. Do, do you think this is just like the people in power have their minds made up that she's going to be president? I don't know. I mean, I'm not so sure. I, 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 I have to admit, I don't follow politics as, as closely as many, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really interested in who, who wins or who runs. But I've noticed what seems to me a particular viciousness on the part even of some of the mainstream outlets toward, toward uh, Hillary Clinton of late. And I'm just starting to wonder, as a matter of fact, I was – just talking with someone this morning, just sort of wondering whether they might have turned on her because she seems to be getting more grief than I would have expected on these things. No, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, in the past, like, no matter what she did, she's kind of very hero worshipped, especially by a lot of American women here in the United States. Uh, a lot of them look up to her. I see her picture with um, a lot of women, you know, on people's Instagrams, on people's Facebook profile pages. If they got a picture of Hillary, that's like one of the top ones. So. Yeah, I mean, for, from our perspective, you know, what's what's most disturbing is that you do find a lot of progressive Democrats who would otherwise, you know, be very friendly toward what we do at the Institute. Because, as you know, we have great people like Dennis Kucinich on our board, and we're a, we're certainly not a Republican or a conservative organization. We're we're very ecumenical when it comes to opposing war. But you have a lot of progressive Democrats who. Who, who see that big D there in front of her name and will follow her. But she's, in fact, as you know, one of the, one of the greatest war hawks we have in government these days. You know, she almost single-handedly made sure that we went in and invaded Libya and turned the place into an absolute hellhole. And she was actually proud of it. You know, we came, we saw, and he died, she said with glee, as, as Gaddafi was 
was uh, sexually assaulted and then murdered. You know, imagine the kind of person who takes glee in that. It's 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 really awful. So this is a horrible war hawk who will really destroy our economy by bringing us into war. And it's very disappointing that you do see a lot of progressives who, you know, who, who, who are not able to see past the fact that she has that party affiliation next to her. Yeah, I agree. It's blind party party following um, for, from a lot of people here in D.C. And, and in the Democratic Party or Republican Party ranks. And given the scandals, I mean, that Hillary and Bo have had, I, I'm shocked that they still have, you know, any type of respect in, in the community. But um, it's, it's just mind boggling, you know, with all the scandals they've had, how they've managed to come through most of them. But, you know, maybe finally they'll run into um, they'll they'll uh, the one scandal will finally, you know, put them into irrelevance, hopefully in the future. <laughs> that could be true. But Hillary is a. She's as much as I despise her her philosophy and her uh, her behavior in in government. She is a formidable person. She's a she's a fiercely intelligent and formidable foe. So I would definitely not to sell her uh, too short on those things. She may well find a way to come back yet. Now, um, you you said you hadn't seen the story on the uh, Obama declares Venezuela a threat to national security. So we'll leave that for another time for the next discussion. But um, my my last question for you then. It is about Edward Snowden. Um, we've just seen him uh, basically be a, a hero. He's been very selfless. Um, he doesn't really care that much what's happened to him. We've seen in, Amer uh, in mainstream American media them try to portray the story that he wants to come home and he's willing to do, do a deal. But when I listened to him speak, he didn't seem interested in that at all. Um, do, you, do you think there's going to be a lot more news coming out about like the crazy stuff that the U.S. has done in the foreign policy uh, that he's uh, – documents that he's withheld that will eventually be released? Let's hope so. I think the more the better. The more we can find out about what the government does in secret, the better the better off we all are, the more free we all are. You know, why, why is it – we're not allowed to have any secrets. The government is allowed to spy on our phones and on our personal lives, but they, they, they take for themselves the right to have every secret you can imagine. So anything that, that reveals what they do in secret in our name and with our money I think is a very, very good thing for freedom and liberty, and in, as such, it is pro-American and it's pro-patriotic. Exactly. I mean, he's a whistleblower. He's trying to reform government. Um, he's dissenter. He's trying to fix things. He's trying to solve a problem. If he was a, if he was in the private sector, that would be called an entrepreneur, right? But because he's trying to reform government, who's already big, it's a leviathan. Um, you know, government doesn't want to be looked at as bad. It doesn't want to admit mistakes, you know, unless it has to. And we have all these, um, these, these bureaucrats, all these politicians who, you know, they're making big bucks. Some of them are making way over $70,000 a year in very cushy jobs. That's a point that er Edward Snowden brought up um, when I listened to him speak uh, about a month ago. He said, you know, I brought it to all my bosses. Um, you know, I tried to. I said what we're doing was illegal. And he and he was like off the record. All of his bosses agreed with him, <laughs> but they told him not to put it on the record, and they told him to stop complaining uh, if he wanted to keep his job and you know two hundred thousand dollar a year job and start work uh, and keep working there or not be investigated. So uh, it's just it's just amazing that you know so many people are getting rich off the status quo. They know it's wrong. They know it's immoral, and they're still doing it anyway. Well, you 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 live in Washington, as you say, Jason, and you know what it's like. You know the kinds of people that live in Clifton, that live in McLean, that live in Great Falls. These are people who are who are living off of the rest of us. They make a great living by scaring the heck out of everyone that, that there are so many dangerous things that we have to increase our military for. These are the people who, who live very, very well off of this. And I think you know, people like, like Snowden and really any whistleblower who's willing to make a sacrifice, as you say, that's why they, they should be valued you know, for, for the services they provide. And I think... I don't know what I, I haven't heard Snowden. I don't know if he's really thinking about coming back, but he might want to have a chat with Chelsea Manning to find out what it's like. If it's better to be back here in a horrible cell, or, or you know, maybe living at least a somewhat normal life in Moscow. Who knows? Yeah, I, I, I don't think he he wants to come back. I think it was very clear when I was listening to him speak that he doesn't think the government's ready to accept him. Um, because they're still, you know, neocons oh, and other people. They're ready to accept him. They have a cell ready for him right now. <laughs> oh no, I mean ready to accept, re ready to part. Sorry, ready to pardon him. No, I'm just, not, I'm not... just making a joke. They're, they're ready for him. They're ready for him. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, the CIA has probably, um, uh, it's probably been discussed, you know, looking for ways to, to get rid of him <laughs> before more documents are released. But, you know, the documents aren't only in his hands anymore, right? So they're in multiple people's hands. So at this point, it doesn't matter if they take him out because he's already um, 
probably given the documents on whatever else has been released to other people. Yeah, that could be the, that certainly could be the case. But there are a lot of whistleblowers, and you know they all do a good service when they expose what the government does in secret. Yeah, I, I think it's a selfless, selfless act. I think it's very heroic of the whistleblowers, and I think they should be applauded for um, being willing to try to come forward and reform the government and change and fix things. But um, you know, that's just the, the the big government, the welfare warfare state, all this bureaucracy. They don't want to admit they make mistakes. But you know, that's not how a, a healthy organization or um, or anything, a, a complex system, uh, an organism, they don't survive by not adapting. So, uh, so if big government is not going to be willing to adapt, I mean, eventually it's going to go the way of the dodo bird, or it's going to go the way of the British Empire or the Roman Empire, right? Yes, and we're going to be the ones who suffer first because we're going to be the ones who are broke, you know. So hopefully, you know, some of us have precious metals and things that are that will help us when the crash comes. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, I, I think right now we're we're not in a hyperinflation risk per se, but I I, I think in the next ten years, I think the U.S. is a sole world reserve currency status. The foreigners of the G20, they're just fed up with us, you know, for a whole bunch of different reasons. Whether it's you know the spying or the the aggressive foreign policy or dragging people into all these countries, um, or you know regime changes with coups and things like that. A, a lot of our allies are just getting really fed up with with dealing with all of this stuff. No, you're absolutely right, Jason. Absolutely. Well, um, I, I just want to thank you for this discussion, Daniel. Um, your your uh, organization, the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, it is dependent on donations, right? Absolutely, we're a 501c3, so everything is completely tax deductible. Okay, great. Well, um, if our if our listeners can donate, um, I think that would be great. You guys put out a lot of good uh, a lot of good news and information, and it's a lot better than the viewpoint that uh, I get from uh, CNBC or CNN or any of these uh, mainstream websites that um it's just all political spin and you know that Putin is Putin is evil, uh, Putin is only evil, and he's only done bad things, <laughs> and you know he's killing all these. Yeah, he's doing everything bad. Yeah, it's just it's just the propaganda. Daniel is whether it's with Putin or so many other people. It's just it's just getting like head scratchingly ridiculous that people would believe this stuff. Yeah, and, and even if, if people aren't able to donate, I would just encourage them to come look at our site, ronpaulinstitute.org, and just see what we do. We have some new things every day and so we'd love to have we'd love to hear from people and hear what people think about uh, about what we're up to. Yeah. Okay, great. Well I, I do enjoy your website. It's bookmarked and I, I check it out for for current events. I uh, just want to thank you again for your time and um Hopefully you enjoyed this interview, and we can have you back on every couple months to talk about the, the geopolitical climate. That sounds great. Thanks, Jason.